So hi everyone. In this video, I am going to discuss with you all few important topics which are asked again and again in your all the examinations, whether it is NEET or INI CET pattern. But right now we are focused on 10 most important images I am showing you and there are high chances that these are asked in your any of the conducted examinations. Okay, so uh, let's see what all I have kept over here. So through these 10 questions, my motive is just to tell you that the topic as such is important. And now when we are uh, moving towards more of a clinical kind of scenarios, the 200 questions only in three and a half hours to be done. So I presume that line which will be somewhat lengthier for majority of the questions. But yes, there will be some simple questions as well, like we used to have in any of the neat examination. Okay, so let's see how we have to catch the important points to reach to some diagnosis when it comes to orthopedics. Let's start with it. Okay, so uh, the very first question, a 25 year old male presents with swelling over right knee since last few months. Okay, when you start reading your question, just have a look whether the question is readable in a significant amount of time or it will be taking a lot of time. So if it is readable, let's say I'll be able to read it in some 20, 30 seconds, 40 seconds. That is absolutely okay. Fine. Let's start with this 25 year old male. First point, right? There is uh, swelling over the right knee area. Swelling differentials should come here only to my mind. 25 year old male swelling around knee. What all is possible? It can be a trauma. It can be a tumor. It can be some sort of infection. Okay. Since last few months, initially there was mild to moderate pain, but for last one month, the swelling has suddenly increased and there is severe pain too. So trauma is ruled out because the swelling has been there for a long time. What remains is your tuberculosis and the tumor. Tuberculosis means any kind of infection or the tumor. So now the second, so tumor excluded, tumor and tuberculosis, two points remaining with us. So now the pain was there, mild to moderate initially, but now for last some time, for last, what you're saying is one month, the swelling has suddenly increased and there is severe pain too. So either it is an acute flare of the infection, quite a possibility, or the tumor has malignancy, which is now flaring up instantly. Okay. On examination, there is severe tenderness, quite possible in both of them. The radiograph and gross specimen is shown here. Which of the following statement is true regarding the conditions? So now I know either it is an infective condition or it is a malignant condition. Both of them are quite possible. Looking at the x-ray or the specimen which is given to us, what we appreciate that epiphyseal area seems to be clean. The epiphyseal area, it seems to be clean. And what is involved over here is a metaphyseal area. Metaphyseal area is showing me some increase in density inside the bone and then there is a gross destruction of the cortex area as well as there is elevation of the periosteal region, right? This is what is happening over here now. Now I know by my knowledge of tumors, by my knowledge of infection that if it is, it has been a chronic infection of the joint, it will destroy the joint area. That is one. If it is an infection in the bone, I know that metaphyseal area is the most commonest area, but point is metaphyseal infections, the osteomyelitis, what we call it, it usually doesn't destroy the cortex as such. It will start destroying the inner part of the bone and then it will uh, uh, destroy the cortex and there should be associated features as well. It will not cause increase in thickness of the bone like this. It will not cause a uh, formation of the bone. On the other hand, it will cause a destruction. So infective pathologies, they don't increase the bone mass. They will destroy the bone. So destruction is not evitable, uh, inevitable in the cases of infections. So here I see there is increase in the mass, which now tells me or gives me a hint that rather than infection, I should prefer a malignant pathology. So by my tumor knowledge, I always tell this in my class that always wherever you are suspecting a tumor, expecting a tumor, a tumor is asked, we always go in a sequence. What is the sequence we always talk about? First of all, see what is the site involved in your x-ray. So site involved here is metaphysis. We never try to change the sequence because that can sometimes make our answer go wrong. So first is metaphysis. Second, we say that try to find out the nature of the tumor. So most important always remains is the site. Second is the nature. Try to find out if you can make out what is the nature of the tumor. Is it benign? Is it benign with malignant potential? Is it malignant? So here we have got features of malignancy. What are the features of malignancy seen in this x-ray? Destruction of the cortices as well as the elevation here. See this? The elevation here of the periosteum. So periosteal reaction, destruction of the cortices, these favor malignant tumor. So nature malignant. 
So I hope that everybody has gone through the image that we usually discuss in our class, the single image which tells you the important point of all the tumors. If you have not yet seen that, please go to my telegram group, DBMC premier group, Facebook or telegram everywhere I have posted that image of tumors. Go through it in the single page. It will be a revision of all the tumors, right? So nature is malignant by the upper two points. I hope if you have revised the tumors well by that image, you can easily make out what is the diagnosis. Metaphysis malignant. Only one tumor is there. What is that tumor? That is osteosarcoma. Let's say you are not able to make out by the upper two points. What is the diagnosis? Then we go to the third point and that's what you call the special feature. So for any of the tumor, the sequence has to be followed. The site, the nature and then the special feature. And here the special feature is elevation of this cortex here. What is this? This is what you call Cordman's triangle. So here in this particular image, I am able to see Cordman's triangle. Here I am able to see Cordman's triangle. So metaphysis, malignancy and Cordman's triangle, they all favor your one diagnosis that is osteosarcoma. So let's see what they are trying to say. It is a bone forming primary malignant bone tumor of the bone. Exactly, osteosarcoma. That is what the name is. Osteo is bone. Sarc, soft tissue. Oma, the tumor, the tumor which involves the bone as well as the soft tissue, right? So it is proliferative tumor which increases the bone. The arrowhead in the radiograph is a Cordman's triangle. Yes, it is a Cordman's triangle. And we know why we have a Cordman's triangle. There are two types of questions related to the Cordman's. One, what it is. So remember that Cordman's is a periosteal reaction. What is sundry appearance? Periosteal reaction. What is onion peel appearance? A periosteal reaction. Now the question is why there is Cordman's triangle? The Cordman's triangle is an incomplete triangle. It has got only two boundaries. One, the bone. Second, the elevation of the periosteum, right? And why it is there? The periosteum tries to get up from the bone to cover up whatever pathology is there. And that's the reason why we are able to see any of the Cordman's triangle, right? So third is hematogenous spread with lung metastasis are common. Obviously, malignancy is there and through blood, through hematogenous route, they will have to show metastasis. So all the three options given over here, they are true in relation to the condition being shown to me in the x-ray as well as via specimen. Okay. Osteosarcoma from tumor, tumor point of view, I would suggest that you must, must go through with these tumors before going for your examination. Osteosarcoma, giant cell tumor, ABC and UBC. These are, I'm just telling you, I don't say that rest of the tumors are not important. But yes, these are the tumors. In, in fact, this osteosarcoma has not been asked. It was only asked in the year 2020. But these three, GCT, ABC and UBC, you must know every line about them. These have been frequently asked tumors in last few years of all the prime examinations. Okay, let's move on to the second one. A eight-year-old child presents an OPD with severe claw, more prominent than the little and the ring finger for last one month. Okay. So age, eight years, skeletal immature, he is having claw, so severe claw and I know claw is because of nerve obviously, no more prominent in the little and the ring finger. So little and ring finger is involved for last one month. So I know from the first two lines that there is a claw, little and the ring finger, these two for last one month and claw I know is because of nerve and if these are claw is in these two fingers, prominently in these two, I know which nerve is involved. I know from the first two line that ulnar nerve is gone. So somewhere ulnar nerve is injured. That's point one. No history of recent trauma. But question is there is no recent trauma. His father, a farmer is so worried and says his child is passing through bad fate. Okay. So father is somebody who believes in, you know, superstitions and so many other things. And he says his child is not doing well with the fate. Why? He had history of fall from tree two years back. Okay. So he was having injury when he was six years old for which he was given a plaster for some injury on the elbow. Right. Then last year he had an ankle injury. And now without injury, he is having this problem. And even the left elbow is showing some deformity. So what are the concerns of the father? The concern of father is that every year the child is getting some problem. Two years back, he fell from tree. Plaster was given. That was fine. Last year, he had an ankle injury. Maybe some treatment was given. He was fine. And now this year without injury, he is having this problem. Okay. So that's why the father is thinking there is something wrong with the fate of the child. But now as a clinician, I know what is wrong. I know that he is having right now ulnar nerve involvement. Right now, there is no trauma, right? But there is a hint given that two years back, he fell from tree. Okay, some injury around the elbow. Last year, is had ankle injury. That doesn't seem relevant to this case because now we are talking about the deformity or problem in the upper limb, right? 
So even the left elbow is showing some deformity. So elbow is having a deformity, two years old trauma and now the claw hand. What diagnosis should come to my mind? Have a look on the x-ray. X-ray shown here, which of the following option is not correct in relation to the above case scenario. So ulnar nerve involved after how much time? After two years of the primary injury. So what hint that gives you? This is what we call the tardy ulnar nerve palsy, isn't it? That's what you call a tardy ulnar nerve palsy. And now when you look at the radial head here, this is radial head. What above radial head we are supposed to see? The capital M, but not visible clearly. And this big chunk, the lateral condyle, this capital M is here, this smaller one here. But this lateral condyle is big chunk which is separate away from the primary bone. Isn't it? That is what we are seeing. So this tardy ulnar nerve palsy is associated with which injury? Do we recall it? The diagnosis for this particular patient, it will be a fracture. Diagnosis for this particular patient is a fracture of lateral condyle of humerus. Do we recall it? So tardy ulnar nerve palsy, had it been a case in which the quotient says the patient had injury and now after one week of injury, he is showing you the claw. That suggests you injury around the medial side. But now when the injury is on the elbow, around the elbow and now involvement of nerve is late, we know it is a tardy ulnar nerve palsy which is related to the fracture little condyle of humerus. Now let's see which of the statement is not correct. The fracture should have been treated surgically initially only. That's absolutely right. Because this little condyle injury is what we call the fracture of necessity. Don't we call it? Because there are three fracture of common fractures which are a fracture of necessity. One is lateral epicondyle. One is what you call galaxy in the upper limb. And third is a fracture neck of femur. These three are the fractures of necessities. So these should be fixed when the patient comes to you. So two years back when he had the trauma, somebody put a plaster, fixed it by plaster only, treated it by plaster only. That was not the right decision. The deformity on elbow is most likely valgus. Do we recall why do we get valgus over here? Valgus is because now this part, the lateral side will not grow because it is not attached to the parent bone. So we don't expect any kind of proper growth here. Medial side keeps on growing and with time, the elbow shows you a deformity on the lateral side, right? Why this deformity is there? It is all because this fracture of necessity was not treated surgically. And when it is not treated surgically, what it leads to is non-union. So when there is a non-union, what is going to happen? When there is non-union, it will lead to a valgus deformity. What do we call it? The cubitus valgus deformity, right? So yes, that is also correct. Deformity occurs due to malunion of the fragment. No, it is not malunion. It is non-union and that's why we call it a fracture of necessity. Common extensors are attached to it, right? Malunion is a feature which is seen with metaphyseal injuries. For example, Coley's fracture. For example, supracondylar humerus fracture right so these are metaphyseal areas injuries and whenever there is an injury at metaphysis it has got a high chance of union because we know metaphysis is the most vascular area of the bone right so supracondylars coles they always unite so malunion is a feature of supracondylar and not lateral condyle so this third statement seems to be wrong nerve involved is ulnar nerve yes that's right but that is usually a tardy ulnar nerve palsy it's a late involvement so what was the sequence of injury? He fell down, he had a fracture of lateral condyle, plaster was given, fracture did not unite it, non-union, valgus deformity and now when the limb is going into valgus, it is showing or it is causing a stretch on the medial structures and that's what is producing the claw in these two fingers. Got the point? So now this is a very very important topic. Now uh, again, with this topic from the trauma, I would suggest that elbow is one of the most important region from where we are getting questions almost every time. Either in the form of supracondylar injuries, either associated with little condyle that we just discussed right now, or in relation to the last 2020 AIMS exam question, it was a fishtail deformity which was asked. So what was that fishtail deformity? They simply asked, fishtail deformity is associated with which joint? So fishtail deformity is basically a consequence of the necrosis of the trochlea. So whenever there is a necrosis of trochlea, what we are going to see, the lower humerus will be appearing like this. Will be appearing like this. The trochlear area here will be necrosed. Either this is the most important reason why we see any of the fish tail deformity like the fish. Other reasons can be when it is a sequelae of fractures like lateral condyle, supracondylar humerus in which some part of the bone may become necrotic, right? Or osteonecrosis we say call it, okay? So supracondylar, lateral condyle, 
three point relationship facial deformity these are important things you must revise from elbow area from trauma part okay let's move on to the next one 60 year old lady okay presented on stretcher in opd so 60 year unable to walk first point in my question she complains of inability to bear weight on her left lower limb so unable to put weight that's why she is lying on stretcher she fell down at home 1.5 months back so one and a half month back she fell down okay and she was admitted somewhere and was being treated as a case of soft tissue injury absolutely fine so the primary surgeon or the primary doctor diagnosed the patient to be a case of soft tissue injury admitted her gave some treatment to her age is 60 trauma is there 1.5 months back now she has come to us in the opd and uh, the surgeon decided to get some investigation report enclosed below which of the following is incorrect in relation to the suspected disease obviously when the patient is coming to you clinically you will just examine them so patient is now having inability to bear weight on the left lower limb maybe something wrong with the knee maybe with the hip maybe with the ankle maybe with femur or tibia somewhere like that that is why he's not put, uh, she's not putting the weight on her lower limb so primary surgeon diagnosed uh, the lady to be a case of soft tissue injury only some treatment given but lady is not relieved now she has come to us we advise certain investigation and we get our investigation what investigation we get done dexa scan okay so i ordered for dexa scan let's see what is the report summary of dexa bone densitometry ls spine femur and radius why we get these three primary areas why we get these three primary areas do we recall something vertebra radius and the femur why because we know that these are the primary areas which are involved in condition which condition the condition of osteoporosis do we recall that these are the three areas which we remember are involved in osteoporosis that's why usually the dexa is taken over these regions can be taken over other regions as well like calcaneum like in tibia but usually the three primary reasons which were regions which are primarily involved in osteoporosis let's read the report what it says the bmd of l1 to l4 vertebra is 1.054 t score is minus 1.1 seems okay doesn't matter that it is not uh, that poor bmd of the neck of left femur where she is having pain on the left side she is unable to put weight on the left side how much is that minus 2.7 so what is that minus 2.7 signifies minus 2.7 signifies definitely your what osteoporosis isn't it that signifies her osteoporosis what about the right neck of femur it is minus 2.1 what does that signify minus 2.1 that signifies your osteopenia the t score right and then you see the right radius and the left radius how much is that minus 5.2 and 5.4 it is severe osteoporosis isn't it so what we have seen we got a dexa scan done and we have diagnosed a lady to be severely osteoporotic who is not able to bear weight on her left lower limb now the question is which of the following is incorrect in relation to the suspected disease so what is a suspected disease it is not now suspected it is now confirmed because for osteoporosis what is a gold standard we have the gold standard to diagnose a patient of osteoporosis the gold standard to diagnose the patient of osteoporosis is what dexa scan that is what we know isn't it now something should come to my mind the next investigation should be mri is it so should i go for an mri or no yes no what do you say i think i should go for it why because it is already 1.5 month old injury one and a half month old injury i now can really really suspect that probably something is wrong with the left neck of femur because my dexa is showing me sorry my dexa is showing me osteoporosis bad bad picture in the radius so mri because i know mri is the investigation of choice for soft tissue injuries but then again the mri is the investigation of choice when we are suspecting stress fractures number one and second whenever we are suspecting a occult fracture a fracture which is related to a vascular necrosis is it not yes so next investigation should be mri so we remember that for suspecting avian for the fractures of scaphoid for the fracture of talus for the fracture of neck of femur when we are suspecting some sort of avian we know that we have to go for mri yes so statement seems to be correct there is high chances of fracture neck fever in this patient yes or no yes why not she had a fall 
she is having poor DEXA score, T score, so definitely there is a high chance that she might be having a fracture. Giving elendronate only can easily cure this patient. What is that elendronate? That's a bisphosphonate. So giving bisphosphonate alone will cure this patient. Is it right? No. As I always say that treating osteoporosis is like filling a bucket which has hole in it. So you have opened the tap. The tap is giving you water. But because of this hole, this water will spill out. So when you are putting bisphosphonate, what you are doing is only filling this hole. That means you will not allow the further spillage. You will not allow the further resorption of the bone. So bisphosphonates, what they do? They inhibit the resorption of the bone, right? And what we have to do is, on one hand, we should close this hole. That means we should inhibit resorption. We should inhibit resorption. As well as, on the other hand, what about what all bone is resorbed? So on the other hand, what we have to do is, we should promote the formation also. We should promote the formation also. Got the point? So, osteoporosis should always be treated by a dual management in which on one hand, we are forming the bone. On the other hand, we are helping to inhibit the resorption of the bone, right? Osteoporosis is one of the most important topics which has been asked repeatedly in all your examinations, right? You must know the important sites, the vertebra, neck of femur, coles, right? We know how the patient comes to you. We should know that. It is because of fractures. Okay. So vertebral collapse, the wedge fracture or the compression fractures, impacted fractures. So these all three sites, they show you impacted fractures. The neck of femur is impacted. Coles is impacted. Vertebra is impacted. These are important features of the osteoporosis. Then the, when you talk of radiological evaluations, we know that in osteoporosis, we are having codfish spine appearance. Then we have the hump on the back of the old ladies, old people. That's what you call Dovegar's hump because of multiple compressions of the vertebra, right? And then obviously, when you talk about the investigation part, the gold standard is always a DEXA. What will happen to the serum mineralization? We should remember that it remains normal in osteoporosis. Moving on to the treatment part, as I said, the treatment should always include the dual plan, the drugs which inhibit resorption, the drugs which inhibit resorption. And second is the drugs which promote the formation. The drugs which promote the formation. So we must focus on both the parameters at the same time. So drugs which inhibit resorption, they are number one, they are number one, the bisphosphonates. We know different bisphosphonates. So bisphosphonates. Number two is calcitonin. And we should know that how this calcitonin is available. It is available in the form of nasal spray. Third is estrogen. And fourth is selective estrogen receptor modulators. These are four. Now, when if they ask you ever, which they asked last time also, that if a old age lady is there with you, which of the following will be the drug of choice, whether estrogen or whether bisphosphonates. So we always go with the bisphosphonate. These are the drug of choice for us. Estrogens were preferred when bisphosphonates were not there in trend. But now we see estrogen is not that much required when you use bisphosphonates which give you much better result in any of the patient with a male or a female right bone uh, the drugs which promote the formation obviously they are your teriparatide which we know is a synthetic analog of parathyroid hormone second is the calcium that we are fond of giving every patient in orthopedic opd patient coming to you with knee pain calcium backache calcium headache calcium so don't be in a habit of giving calcium to everybody it doesn't solve any purpose okay so it has to be a dual management and obviously for their absorption what we need is calci trial what we need is calci trial right the vitamin d so these are the drugs which promote the formation then we have got the drug which has got a dual action which drug is that that is strontium renylate that is strontium renylate this strontium renylate has got dual action. It will inhibit as well as it will promote the formation, right? Then we have got certain other drugs that you must know. One is denosumab. One is denosumab. What is that? Denosumab is a drug which blocks the rank ligands. So indirectly, what it is doing, it is not allowing the osteoclast to get activated and therefore it is working in this fashion only by inhibiting the resorption, right? Then you have got newer drugs for osteoporosis. One is 
pyrotide and other is romosuzumab abelopyrotide and romosuzumab these are two newer drugs so this is working like teriperotide and romosuzumab is again it is working like a strontium dual action so these are new drugs abelopyrotide and the romosuzumab which can be used are FDA approved now back in the year, I guess, if I'm not wrong, in 2018 or 19, these were FDA approved. Okay, so these are different drugs that we must remember for osteoporosis. It's a very, very important topic. Please go through the notes and do revise it very properly. You must not go in exams without reading two or three very, very important topics. One, osteoporosis. Second, I said the injuries around elbow, supracondylar, lateral condyle, three-point relationship, fishtail, I've already mentioned that. Third is in trauma, it is scoliosis. It has been asked a number of time in the last two years. Okay, very, very important. Tumor, I have already mentioned from the tumor part, the GCT, UBC, ABC have been frequently asked. So you must, must revise these topics at least very, very thoroughly before going for exam. Okay, let's start with the next one. A 55-year-old female, right, the age is 55, female, presented with polyarthralgia, so something related to the joint, okay, for last 10 to 15 years, she has been taking irregular medication with some mild to moderate relief. So not yet diagnosed, mild to moderate relief, off and on medication, that's fine. She has been ignoring it for long, but now for last four to five months, she has started getting swelling, okay. For last four to five months, the disease has flared up and now she's having swelling around her wrist, finger, ankle region and some deformities in the hand also, okay. Which of the following is not correct about the condition she might be suffering from? Her clinical photograph is attached. Fine. So she is 55 year old lady. Some joint problem with some swelling. For many years she has been avoiding it. But now when she is 55, I expect that uh, usually the patient of the rheumatoid arthritis. Let's talk of all the arthropathies. Osteoarthritis, obviously more common in females. Household workers all the time working. But usual presentation is knee pain. Rheumatoid, again, most common presentation in male females. And with bilateral symmetrical involvement of the joints that is what they are telling you that she is having polyarthralgia but symmetrical asymmetrical is not mentioned but now i don't expect ra at the age of 55 but now in history only it is mentioned that she is having the similar complaint for last 10 to 15 years so when she was around 35 she started having this complaint so i can expect ra at that age now they are saying there is swelling around the wrist area now, with this wrist knowledge, I know that in osteoarthritis, the wrist area is spared. And in RA, involvement of wrist is almost a rule. More than 90 to 95% patients we see there is involvement of the wrist area, right? So, I'll go with the line of maybe OA, maybe RA. So, OA is excluded. Anyhow, third arthropathy which is common, ankylosing spondylitis. But it is more common in males in the spinal area, in the sacroiliac joints, right? Now, look at the uh, clinical photograph. What I see here... This area, the PIP seems to be hyperextended and DIP seems to be flexed in both the fingers. In all the fingers, in fact, this finger I cannot appreciate, but it's the rest of the fingers. And here in the index here, when I'm getting the photo of the left hand, I'm able to see this. What exactly is this? Is this not a swan neck? Is this not a swan neck? So if it is swan neck, it is giving me a hint. Probably the lady is suffering from which disorder? The lady is suffering from rheumatoid arthritis the lady is suffering from rheumatoid arthritis, isn't it? So now, what should be the plan? She should be started on DMARDs and steroids. Obviously, that is a treatment plan that we have to go for it. The best investigation done is NTCCP antibodies. That is also right, we know. How to diagnose RA? Earlier, there were 1987 criteria in which out of seven points, four used to be, uh, four should have been there to call it RA. But now, there are other criteria. We call it a ULR criteria, European Union criteria. So, what they, in a, what they uh, consider to make a patient diagnosis of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, ESR and CRP, which we know is elevated in the case of RA, they will be elevated. Then there is bilaterally symmetrical involvement of the joints, so joint involvement. Then third is about the stiffness of the joint. And then fourth, the RA factor, we say RA factor and then NDCCPs. So clinically evaluated patient, a clinical evaluation as well as the laboratory markers all are used now to make a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So NTCCP obviously is the best one because we know rheumatoid arthritis is not specific for rheumatoid, uh, this uh, RA factor is not very specific for rheumatoid arthritis. RA factor 
can correlate with the disease activity. It can help you guide the prognosis, but it doesn't tell you that the patient is not having rheumatoid arthritis. We can have seronegative arthropathies as well. Okay, so deformities, deformities are due to ligamentous laxity or damage. Right, so deformities are due to ligamentous laxity or damage. That's absolutely right. The deformities primarily in the hand are due to ligamentous laxities, the capsules, the bolar plate. DIP are least likely to be involved in this particular disorder. So I think that when they are asking you which of the following is not correct. So I think all the given four options are correct here. All the four options are given uh, correct here. So I would uh, I would have preferred to just tell you the topic that how it is going to be asked. So all the four options, I think they are correct. Instead of DIP, if they say DIP are least likely to be involved, that is right, maybe involved. PIPs are usually involved. And what else is not involved in rheumatoid arthritis other than DIP? The vertebra is also usually not involved except except the C1 and C2. Except for the C1 and C2. So atlanto axial subluxation can very well be a part of rheumatoid arthritis. So I don't find any of the four options is wrong. All the four options seems to be fine to me. Right. So uh, the topic from here, I would like you to uh, just recall all your arthropathies in one go. Close your notebooks and just think in your mind. Arthropathy topic. OA, how we have to revise. Cartilage, knee, medial compartment, genovarum. Four points, not involved joints are your wrist, the MCPs except first MCP. Treatment options, one, two, three, four, five. RA, female, morning stiffness, bilateral symmetrical involvement of the joints, Wrist involvement is there, not involved are the DIP, the vertebra, except C1, C2. Deformities in the hand, Z deformity, swan neck, botanium. Correct? Investigation, anemia, ESR, CRP raised, RA factor, as I said, what it means, and NTCCP. Treatment part, DMARDs, steroids, biologicals. Okay? Obviously, with NSAIDs. Ankylosing spondylitis, sacroiliac joint involvement first, Young male, morning stiffness, improving with the physical activity, gradually ascending up. Gansolin test, pump handle test, x-ray show you the bamboo spine, right? Treatment part, biologicals, phenylbutazone, methotrexate, NSAIDs, these are all being tried. Hemophilic arthropathies, the hemophilia obviously knee is the most common joint involved, swelling, then triple deformity of the knee and then compression bandaging is the treatment. What is relative contraindication is aspiration as well as the arthroscopy. This is relative contraindication. Gouty arthritis, remember this, involvement of the first MTP, podagra, will be seen. Pseudogout, most commonly involved is the knee joint, swelling, no signs of inflammation. Best way to diagnose gout and pseudogout is by aspiration. And at last, when they talk about neuropathic joint, you must know that what all joint is involved with what particular neuropathy. That means diabetes, the most commonest cause, it causes involvement of the Inter uh, tarsal joints. Tapes dorsalis, the syphilis, will cause involvement of knee. Leprosy causes involvement of the fingers. So that is all in arthropathy. That's how you need to revise your topics. Okay. So let's move on to the next one. 35 year old male presents with severe stiffness in the fingers of both the hands. Severe pain while trying to flex or extend the knee. So he's not able to bend or uh, you know extend the fingers properly. On compression over the wrist region, there is severe numbness in the fingers. Which of these is not true regarding this condition? So what do you see? What do you uh, uh, think it is happening? When the examiner is trying to press in the wrist area, what they are trying to compress is the median nerve. So what probably I am thinking of? I am thinking of carpal tunnel syndrome. I am thinking of carpal tunnel syndrome. Right? When the patient is having some problem bilaterally in both the hands, I suspect some systemic problem usually. Right? So most probable diagnosis is carpal tunnel syndrome. Obviously, that is what we are suspecting. The best investigation would be NCV. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely right. Nerve conduction velocity is the best test. The best test is phalanx to diagnose this condition clinically. Is it true? It is not true. The best clinical test, the phalanx test is done like this. What we do in phalanx is we try to compress the nerve again. When you compress it like this by flexing the wrist, it will create a clinical problem over here. The best test to be done for the uh, carpal tunnel syndrome is directly compressing over the median nerve. That's what we call Durkan test. That is what you call the Durkan test. That's what you call a Durkan test. Right? That's Durkan test. Remember this. Durkan is the best test. And surgery is the best treatment for this? No. No. 
surgery is not the best treatment obviously we say that it is a best treatment if it is required you can go for surgery but majority of the patients can very well improve by conservative management now when this kind of patients come when these kind of patients come who are having severe restriction of the movement role usually they need release of the transverse carpal ligament that is flexor retinaculum so for this particular patient i would say surgery will be needed the best test is not phallus it is durkan right but do remember surgery is not always required usually we can manage most of the patients as conservative pregnancy diabetes thyroid rheumatoid these are certain conditions which are related to the carpal tunnel syndrome okay a 55 year old male presented with inability to bear weight on right side okay he had rta 5 years back and was operated for fracture shaft femur and tibia okay so he was a case of some fracture 5 years back operated on femur as well as tibia after 6 months of surgery he started having discharge from right thigh region so these kind of question should immediately give you the idea what has happened trauma operated discharge osteomyelitis what else we can have discharge from the right thigh region and since then multiple surgeries were done present x ray is attached which of the mentioned condition is not correct about the patient so i know looking at the line which of the question i can very well make out that it's a post operated case post trauma which has got a sinus discharge so it is a case of chronic osteomyelitis it is a case of chronic osteomyelitis the infection now look at the x ray what all i can see in the x ray a plate has been fixed multiple screws and then i can see there is a big gap here in the bone and then there are multiple beads like these what are these beads these are what you call the cemented beads these are what you call the cemented beads why we put these cemented beads these cemented beads basically the pmma polymethyl methacrylate the most commonly used cement there is a powder and there is a liquid when we mix them these become rock hard these are very solid but while mixing them what we do is we put some antibiotic into them like gentamicin like other antibiotics people are fond of mixing many antibiotics so we mix that antibiotic into that powder and we put that bone bead this is known as bone bead into the infected area so that the antibiotic which is now in the bone cement it will be liberated gradually and it will help in removing the or eliminating the infection so these are bone beads the white beads seen on x-ray are bone cement that is what i told you these are bone cement plus antibiotics right putting bone cement only the beads will not help right bone cement is used whenever you are doing a curettage in a big area like when you do in the cases of compression fractures of the vertebra we do the vertebroplasty for example when you are doing removing some tumor when you are removing some pathology when you are doing some curettage you can put bone cement over there to fill the big void okay so this is correct patient needs removal of all this bone and implant as well we know that for chronic osteomyelitis we'll have to remove all the focus right so the primary treatment i would prefer is to remove the implant to remove all the bone cement the bone beads and clean this wash this very very properly and remove all the dead bone that is what you call what sequestrectomy isn't it so yes removal will be needed along with sequestrectomy that is also right starting antibiotic as culture is ideal that is right starting antibiotic as per culture is ideal but yes till 3 to 4 days i can start with empirical therapy okay and shortening is expected in this case because i expect i can see that there is the bone here has not united from here till here i don't see any bone only bone beads are there so shortening will be there right so all the options here seems to be fine to me there is nothing wrong with any of the options purpose of putting this question here is to tell you that what all is important now let's again have a look on the x ray in the x ray in the aims examination in the neat examination what they are focusing on about chronic osteomyelitis number 1 is the x ray so this is a infected case and this is these are all pieces these are all the dead bones this dead bone is what we call sequestrum and we know that sequestrum is a source the infection is all around it so until and unless for the case of chronic osteomyelitis i do the sequestrectomy it is not going to work for me so do remember if they ask you ever in your exam about the x ray how the sequestrum looks like any of the sclerosis all around the sequestrum will be what you call as involucrum is what you call as involucrum right and if the bone is giving you a gap from where the discharge can go out is what we call a cloaca is what we call a cloaca the opening in the bone right so sequestrum sequestrectomy the chronic osteomyelitis 
Second thing, if they ever ask you about the treatment plan for chronic osteomyelitis, now we know the primary treatment would be to go for sequestectomy, that is surgery. If they ask you the treatment plan for acute osteomyelitis, for acute osteomyelitis, the treatment plan primarily is giving antibiotics and then surgery if needed. Okay, that is a base difference between the treatment plan for these two. Because in chronic, we have got a sequestrum that did focus until, until you remove it, the complete infection cannot be eliminated. Right? So, this is very, very important. So, all the four options again seems to me fine. Chronic osteomyelitis, again a repeated question multiple times in last two to three years. Please be thorough with it. A five-year-old child was brought by his father in OPD. Okay. There is a child, five-year-old. Complain of pain around left hip. So, something wrong around the left hip. In whom? A child. Age, five years. So, I must remember the pediatric hip calendar. What all conditions are common at five years of age? Five years, hip pathology. Two important hints I have got. Okay. He says he manages to go out to play in park. But when it's time for school, he's complaining of severe pain around the hip. So, father thinks the child is lying. He doesn't want to go to school. That's why he's making excuses. Is that correct or no? Probably he's telling some lie, but he just bought the child for an opinion. Okay. So, he thought when the child is saying so much, he's having pain, unable to go to school, doesn't want to go to school. Let's go to orthopedician. Let's make a visit and go there. On examination, the child is walking with a painful limb. Okay. So, when you examine five-year-old child, hip, and he's walking with a painful limb. He's walking with a painful limb five-year-old child hip painful limb what all comes to your mind mind one parthes isn't it that comes to my mind second the septic arthritis can that happen very well that can happen septic arthritis these two are the prominent conditions that come to my mind third that can happen is transient synovitis yes so that is what i want you all to revise your any of the short subject like this Close the notebook, keep in your mind, make a story that how the chapter was taught, how the topic was taught, how the contents were taught. One, two, three, four, five. These are the points. So, five year hip painful limb. What are the causes? Parthi, septic arthritis, transient synovitis. Am I right? So, now what are the points which will favor us for particular diagnosis? Parthis, we know four to eight years, but after history of trauma, immediate trauma or old trauma, usually one to two months old trauma. That is what we are getting in the question. Septic arthritis must have important features like restriction of the movements as well. That will happen in any of the infective condition. But then the fever, but then the fever and history of trauma should be there. So fever is not mentioned here, but yes, trauma is mentioned over here. Transient synovitis, how it is presented? It is presented usually after some history of upper respiratory tract infection, URTIs, which is not mentioned over here, right? But for transient synovitis, usually the age group is 5 to 12 years. More common age group for septic arthritis, it is 2 to 5 years, right? So, this is 5 to 12 years. Now, let's have a look on the options. When I have three differential diagnoses, which I cannot make out with the language of the question, let's see what the x-ray can it help us. So, gradually the pain is increasing and is now unable to bear weight on the left side. Okay, let's see which of the following statement is correct or wrong in relation to the disease. Now, when I see the right side, Everything seems to be fine. The head, the bone, the joint, everything seems to be fine. But what I see on left side is there is some sclerosis going on in the head of the femur. Now this septic arthritis, now this septic arthritis is basically arthritis, the joint. The joint seems to be absolutely fine here. But now I have started seeing the changes in the hip. That means it is less likely a case of septic arthritis. Transient synovitis. Synovitis will only show you an increase in the gap, synovial inflammation. And we know that in that case, the attitude of the hip, whenever there is synovitis, whether it is because of septic arthritis or parthes or transient synovitis, it has to be abduction and external rotation so that the capsule is kept in maximum capacity, right? So here the space should have an increased, which I can say maybe there may not be there, but not much appreciable. But now what I can see is there is chlorosis in the head of the femur, some change in the head of the femur which I expect out of these three only in one condition and that is Parthes. So what exactly is Parthes? Parthes is osteochondritis of femoral head. It is osteochondritis of the femoral head. Isn't it? Usually unilateral, 5 to 8, after history of trauma, gradually painful, after synovitis gets into necrosis, initially synovitis may have the increase in the vascularity of the hip, which the head is trying to save itself. 
but the child is managing to play out, go out. So that means on the inflamed head, the child is still walking and that is what causes damage of the head. So inflammatory process has started. Why? Because of trauma. Because he fell down in park some one month back or two months back or three months back. Okay. So which of the following condition is not true or maybe true in out of these options? The child is having an inflammatory pathology of the hip. Yes, that's what you call a osteochondritis. But this disease attitude with advancement or severity of the disease become adduction and external rotation. Is that so? When the synovium is destroyed, when the synovium is inflamed, yes, the patient goes into attitude of external rotation. But when the bony destruction starts, the minimal movement between the acetabulum and the head of the femur and the muscular spasm will make the head of femur go into adduction. The femur goes into adduction. So with advancement in parthes, the head, the joint, the bone will lie in an attitude of adduction and external rotation. This is very, very important. This is only specific. The adduction and external rotation attitude is very, very specific for parthes disease. It is not seen in septic arthritis, transient synovitis, tuberculosis. It is not seen. It is only seen in parthes. They can ask you this question in other way also that which movement is restricted in parthes. So restricted movement will be abduction and internal rotation. Remember this. This movement will be restricted in Parthi's disease. Primary treatment is conservative. Yes, primary treatment is conservative and majority of the patients are treated with splints with both the hips and abduction away like this. The Petri brace, Scottish right brace, these are the braces which can be used for Parthi's disease. Later on, if the patient has come to you in the collapsed stage when the head is absolutely destroyed, definitely we need to do different types of osteotomies. It is usually bilateral. No, this is wrong. It is usually unilateral and only 10 to 15% cases, you can say 10 to 12% cases are bilateral because majority of the patient, they got parthies after trauma. Only some of the children who have got systemic problems like collagenopathies, coagulopathies, sickle cell anemia, protein deficiencies, when they get parthies, that will be a systemic problem and that causes bilateral problems. So 10 to 12% cases, 15% cases maximum. Majority of parthies will be unilateral right okay so next one a one-year-old baby girl was brought with history of fall from bed on examination there is swelling around the mid-thigh region which of the given option is not correct about the associated condition so one-year-old child coming to you with a fracture shaft of the femur and my all purpose the whole purpose of showing you this question this topic is to discuss with you that whenever a child is coming to you with fracture shaft of femur we should know that we are going to treat it as per the protocol that whenever any child is there in less than two years of age, we have got two options to treat the child. One is gallows. One is gallows. And then better than gallows is always a hip spiker. Out of which the gallows can only be used till two only. It is only used in a child who is less than two years or who is less than 15 to 18 kgs. Broadly, we learn it as 20 kgs. After two years, we never use gallows. But hip spica can be used till the age of 5 years and it gives fantastic result. So for this particular patient, I personally would prefer a hip spica or gallows, whatever is given to you in the option. So it should be operated immediately? Absolutely no. 100% no. A big no for this. No, never. We don't need to operate. It should be conserved? Yes, that's absolutely right. At this age, flexible nail is best as it will allow for alignment of both the flexion. See, at this particular age, I don't need to align these fragment. Leave it as such. Even if I leave it as such, it is not going to cause any problem to the child. Children bone, they have got a magnificent, a very good potential for remodeling. And even if I leave, practically telling you, if I leave this bone as such, even then it will remodel fantastically. Right? It will remodel in a fantastic way. At this age, hip spiker is the best option. Yes, I agree to that. It is the best option. So third one is wrong. It is option A is also wrong. Option B is correct and option D is correct. Right? 9. A 25 year old male while traveling in a bus was holding the upper bar. So in the bus you have got an upper bar, no? So to hold it so that you don't fall while standing. The driver suddenly applied brake and patient got a jerk. So when the patient is holding the upper bar like this, right? That means the hand is already abducted. Okay? It has gone upper part. Hyper abducted basically. So when he got the jerk, then he presented to us with this attitude that you can see in the picture on the right side. So abducted and kind of externally rotated. He is not able to like this is internal rotation, but this seems to be in a straight posture. So it immediately needs surgical intervention. What is the diagnosis for this particular patient? 
looking at the shoulder, I can see a bony prominence over here. What I feel, it is a shoulder dislocation. Now, when I see a bony prominence, when I see the contour of the shoulder is destroyed, what should I know? Anterior or posterior dislocation. So, when the uh, joint, when the uh, this architecture of the joint is disturbed, I know it is a anterior dislocation. Right? So, most likely this is a case of anterior dislocation. Why not inferior dislocation? Because in inferior dislocation, the head is to go here. And the patient usually comes to you like this, handled over the head. Because the head has to go below the glenoid. Right? That's why not inferior, it is anterior dislocation. Does it immediately need surgical intervention? No. That's absolutely wrong. Subcoracoid is the most commonest type. Correct? There may be loss of sensation of outer aspect of shoulder. What this point signify? This point signifies you the involvement of which nerve? The axillary nerve. Am I right? It shows you involvement of the axillary nerve. And we know that if axillary is involved, it can lead to both the kinds of problems. Sensory as well as motor. When you talk of sensory, it is what you call the regimental badge sign. That's what we call the regimental badge sign. And when you talk of the motor component, then it will be deltoid and teres minor. Deltoid and teres minor. Right? If deltoid is a problem, abduction 15 to 90 is a problem. Teres minor is affected, external rotation will be a problem. Recurrence is the most common complication. Yes, this is right. So, axillary nerve injury is the most common acute complication. Recurrence is the most common complication overall, which in turn will be related to multiple defects like Hillsack and the bank art in anterior dislocation recurrence and maclaughlin lesion or the reverse hill sac lesion in the posterior dislocation of the shoulder right a 32 year old female presents with severe lower backache with right side radicular pathy okay she is not having any recent history of trauma so without trauma backache and radicular pathy she has be she has gained a lot of weight in the last two years obesity and since then the problem started. Her MRI is attached. Without the given option is not correct about her condition. Okay. So when you look at this area. When you look at this area. This all is your spinal cord. This black is all your spinal cord. Rest of the vertebra seems to be okay. But at this area if you see. This is showing you spondylolisthesis. This is showing you spondylolisthesis. At what level? Spondylolisthesis of L4 over L5. This is the sacrum. You see the last disc is over here. So this one is L5. This is L5. And this is L4. So L4 over L5. So spondylolisthesis of L4 over L5. The most common cause is idiopathic. Spondylolisthesis can have multiple reasons. Like idiopathic, dysplastic, isthmic, degenerative like that. The most common is basically not idiopathic. It is what you call degenerative. The most commonest is degenerative. That has to happen to... You know, uh, with more degeneration of the spine, the vertebra will happen to everybody. Some people will have less, some will have more depending on routine activities. But yes, most commonest is degenerative. We don't call it idiopathic, we call it degenerative, right? Spondylolysis can be one of the cause for this condition. What exactly is spondylolysis? Spondylolysis means a breach in or breach at pars interarticularis, right? Whenever there is a breach at pars interarticularis, how do we observe it? Uh, that will be seen in oblique x-ray. That will be best appreciated in oblique x-ray. How? We'll just see. Best view for this condition, spondylolisthesis is AP view. Is that right? No, that is not right. Best view will be the lateral view as you are seeing in the MRI. Because in a lateral view only, I can see the slip of one vertebra over another vertebra. And AP view can show you inverted Napoleon hat sign. What is that? See this. This is what you call inverted Napoleon hat sign, which is classically seen in the cases of spondylolisthesis it is a late feature which is seen in spondylolisthesis ap view so remember it is a late feature later we will show you listhesis and what is spondylolysis what it will show you you see here this is a complete dog the eye the neck the front paw the back the tail here like this so this is a dog if you see this level here the neck is not continuous it is broken like this so, there is a defect here at pars intraarticularis. This defect of pars intraarticularis is best appreciable in oblique view. And to name it as a special feature, we call it beheaded Scottish dog appearance. Whenever they say, they say Scottish dog appearance, see Scottish dog appearance is a normal thing. It is like a dog, small puppy, 
which is seen in your oblique view of the lumbar spine. When we take the lumbosacral spine x-ray oblique view, we will be able to see the dog. But when you talk of the break at pars intraarticularis, this pars intraarticularis, it makes the neck of the dog. And that, if broken, will be known as beheaded Scottish dog sign. Right? Beheaded or the collar around the neck. Right? So, uh, these were all the important topics that I wish to discuss with you. Obviously, we cannot say that nothing else will be asked. But yes, these are 10 most important topics, including your scoliosis is one of them. Rest of the things I've been mentioning uh, along with the rest of the topics. So please do revise the short subjects very, very quickly. Make a picture in your mind that what all topics, the content, the MCQs have been taught and discussed wherever you are reading it. And uh, I think this lastly for NEAT for all subjects from DBMC is definitely going to work for you. It is going to help you out and uh, you will definitely do well in the upcoming examination. So don't be afraid of the change pattern. Nothing is going to change. Content, the subjects are same. They cannot make question from any other place outside earth. So it is very simple. Whatever being they were asking till now, that all will be asked. Same things will be asked. And the manner in which they are going to ask you will little bit change. So don't be afraid. With full confidence, go for the exam. And I'm very much sure that you will do your best and you'll get some good result in your examinations. So all the very best. Thank you so much for being the patient listeners. And if I can be of any other help to you for any of the orthopedic query, do let me know. Thank you so much, guys.